Nicky Santoro was a cocky son of a He was Italian, a made man, and one hell of an enforcer. But what many made men like Nicky fail to remember is this. You are untouchable. Sure, until you aren't. And in Nicky's case, he broke a whole bunch of mafia rules that are more valuable to the mob than a man's life. You know the rules. Don't whack someone without permission. Don't bring media attention to yourself. But most of all, don't get in the way of profits. And by profits, I mean the kind that put the Las Vegas Strip on the map. Once a tiny desert town, Las Vegas was turned into the world's foremost gambling destination. And from it, the mob created an income stream running into the millions. It became their moneymaker on account of guys like Meyer Lansky and Jimmy Hoffa. At its height way back in the 1920s and 30s, the mafia generated roughly $100,000 in profit every year. In words you and I can understand, that's well over $1 billion in 2016, with Chicago's Al Capone leading the pack. The mafia lorded over American crime for over 50 years, but like most great business families that rise and fall into decay, either by incompetent second generation or by an overindulged third. The mafia finally came to a grinding halt in the 80s, due in part to its greed, but mainly to the follies of drug trafficking. Okay, it didn't actually come to a full stop. You see, the mob's allure came not just from the money, but also from the lifestyle of glitz and glamour, and maybe even serving as an outlet for alpha male aggression. All this is best showcased in the epic 1995 mob movie Casino by Martin Scorsese. Towards the end of their dominance in organized crime, the Mafia's top two income sources were derived mainly from narcotics, coupled with the Northeast numbers game. But out west, gambling in particular was the hottest game in town, and Vegas was the place to be. Also known as Sin City, it was home to mobsters Frank Lefty Rosenthal, depicted as Sam Ace Rothstein in the movie, and Tony the Ant Spilotro depicted as Nicky Santoro. Portrayed by mob movie icon Joe Pesci, Nicky was Ace's right-hand man, his bodyguard, and enforcer for the Chicago outfit. Nicky was tasked with the mob's illegal skimming operation, but also, he was to ensure that nothing got in the way of casino profits, with Ace at the helm of the mob's backed Tangiers. But Nicky had quite an ego, as best seen when he takes that hot, young blonde, who's about a foot taller than he, into the front seat of his car, but with an ego like that, taking a back seat to Ace didn't sit very well with him. Along with Ace, portrayed in the film by the indomitable Robert De Niro and his wife Ginger McKenna, played by the stunningly ferocious Sharon Stone, Casino Comes Alive, due in no small measure to Pesci's character. Pesci's portrayal of the diminutive Nicky and insanely violent enforcer of the Chicago mob is impeccable thanks in part to Nicholas Pileggi, who co-wrote the screenplay, which was based on his novel, Casino, Love and Horror in Las Vegas, which was published the same year the movie hit theaters. But research on Nicky's life reveals he was even more barbaric than the movie let on. This is one of those, you can't make this shit up kind of stories. And it begins in Chicago, hometown of Anthony Tony Spilotro. Spilotro, would later be known in the press as Tony the Ant for being referred to by FBI Special Agent William Romer as a piss ant, and for good reason. Spilotro was a bad seed from the word go. In the four years leading up to his 21st birthday, he had already been arrested 13 times for various petty crimes. His parents ran a mob joint called Patsy's Restaurant, likely the influence on all but one of the six Spilotro sons. But most of all, it must have impressed the young Tony, who committed theft, burglary, and eventually, even murder. With Frank Collada, a friend who would later join him in Vegas, not only to be a member of his crime group called the Hole in the Wall Gang, but who, in the end, would also lead Tony to his downfall. Although, it was a downfall not nearly as astounding as the demise of the mob's Vegas dominance itself. Regardless, it's all thanks to the newsworthy brutality of Tony Spilotro. Yes, Tony wrecked Vegas. The enforcer's initiation into bloodlust likely started with the M&M murders, 
they were depicted in the movie as the head in a vice scene. Up until this point, Spilotro had only engaged in small crimes, but he had qualities that were considered valuable, mainly his reliability and ruthlessness. This drew the attention of Chicago mob associate Sam Mad Dog Stefano, a real sociopath who, at the time, was considered by Romer to be the number one torture murderer in the country. So, it's no wonder Spilotro turned out the way he did, having Mad Dog Sam as his mentor to boot. The murder of William McCarthy and James Moreglia was dubbed the m and murders. Under orders of the higher-ups, Spilotro and Frank tortured and killed the petty criminals for acts considered off-limits by the mob, and Tony saw this as his chance to get made. These murders were to have severe consequences for Spilotro later on. The contrast between the two characters is riveting. Like his real-life counterpart, sports betting expert Lefty Rosenthal aces everything the mob loves about an associate. Although not Italian, Rothstein is not only a good earner, but absolutely dedicated to his craft. On the other hand, Ballbuster Nicky is everything the mob loves about an enforcer, earning him the cushy job of overseeing the skimming operation of the mob, a responsibility which, I think, could literally have gone to anyone else. They formed the perfect dyad, with Nicky being the brawn to Ace's brain. Unfortunately, what they didn't count on was how being in that environment and having that responsibility would get to Nicky's head. This miscalculation had far-reaching effects, both on Rothstein's operations as well as in changing, for the worse, the face of Las Vegas forever. Being a troublemaker, Nicky gets banned from casinos all over Sin City. What was known as being in the Black Book, which had only Al Capone's name in it, Santoro says jokingly. But the ban meant he was cut off from his source of income, and together with his inflated ego, Nicky decided to get his old gang back together, including childhood pal Frank, just as Spilotro did in real life called the Hole in the Wall Gang for literally drilling holes as a way of ingress and egress into the walls of jewelry stores and similar high-profit establishments. Unknown to the gang at the time, they were to lay the groundwork for future organized crime in the city. For that, we can certainly credit Spilotro. Here is when things start getting messed up. In the movie, Nicky disregards the rules of the mob, thinking, well, that he's doing all the work. And besides, the bosses are a thousand miles away. He not only keeps his new activities a secret from the bosses back in Chicago, which actually brings him to mind the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But he then also causes trouble for their earner, Rothstein. Remember that the cardinal rule is to never, ever get in between the mob and their money. But Spilotro had a bloated sense of self-importance, a point he drove home hard in Sam's face, that he unlike the Jew, was Italian. One of them, and a made man. He thought he could do anything. He reminds, no, he warns the numbers guy that he, and not Ace, made all this possible. I mean, can you believe the brass on this guy? I don't know about you, but enforcers must have been a dime a dozen. But a numbers guy? Like Rothstein, guys like that are still hard to come by. Rothstein was indispensable. So, when it came down to it, who do you think ended up getting whacked? Tony the Ant ends up naked and dumped in a ditch in some cornfield somewhere, with his brother, fellow hole-in-the-wall gangster, Dominic. I remember the feeling of overwhelming disappointment at the end of Casino, when they blew up the last mafia stronghold in Las Vegas. In agonizing slow motion, the next scene shows a vulgar horde of straw hat, flip-flop wearing, fast food eating, whatever. We see these tourists dragging their knuckles along as they enter what once was the bastion of glamour and class in the gaming industry. Oblivious droves dressed in tacky outfits. Well... That's the impression I got, anyway. And if I had been there in the 80s, I just know I would have been one of them. Something I already regret saying. Within two generations, it was all gone. The Strip was no longer an exclusive club for classy high rollers and their entourage. 
it became what De Niro's character describes as Disneyland. It became family-friendly and completely commercialized, taken over by the big corporations. It became a damn tourist trap. Images from early on in the movie of captivating, super-hot, ravishingly fierce Ginger McKenna working the room, flashing through my mind, and I started to miss her. Even more, I started to miss the dignified, steely-eyed, utterly impressive, no-nonsense Sam Rothstein, who, as Nikki puts it, had the fucking place clocked. Symbols of a bygone era. Their Vegas must have been one hell of a place.